Welcome to the Find My Catalyst podcast. We all have problems we're looking to solve, and we know that there are solutions out there, but we struggle with this. How do we find the solution? Where does the nudge come from to help us take the next step, start solving tough problems? This podcast is designed to help you find your catalyst and take that next step. I'm Mike Simmons, and I am the founder of Catalyst Acts. This podcast episode, like all, are brought to you by the Catalyst Game Plan. You can find out more at findmycatalyst.com. My catalyst today is Colin Mitchell. He is the VP of sales and managing partner of Ledium and is the upcoming author, one of the co-authors of Outbound Simplified. This episode is an absolute blast. We talk about podcasting, lessons learned, how those things apply to sales. We talk about kids, lessons learned, how those things apply to sales. We go pretty deep on a number of different things. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Let's get to the discussion. Colin, it is great to see you. We've, uh, we're in this kind of echo chamber of revenue leaders, revenue professionals, people who are trying to help organizations get better at growing their businesses. And I feel like we know each other. This is the first time we're actually speaking to each other and meeting. So it's awesome to see you and have a chat with you. How are you doing? Yeah, doing good. Glad we can finally make this happen. It's always it's always interesting when you're meeting somebody that you feel like you know from afar for the first time and while recording a podcast. <laughs> I think that's one of the cool things about podcasting is you get they can go so long and they then the conversations can get pretty deep and the questions start to repeat themselves in some instances where you start to get a feel for how people are going to engage, what people are going to say. And then then you get a chance to meet and you're kind of like, wow, it feels like we've met each other or we've known each other for a much longer time. So that's one of the reasons I love podcasting as a way to communicate and get messages out there. How about you? Yeah. I mean, I've absolutely fell in love with the medium of podcasting. I mean, I've just established and built so many awesome relationships from either going on podcasts, people coming on my show. And then every once in a while, you get one where you think it's going to be awesome and it isn't. So hopefully, hopefully that's not the case today. <laughs> I hope not. What's something you've learned through podcasting that you didn't expect? Mm, good question. Something that I've learned. So early on, when I first started podcasting, and probably my wife was the only person listening to my podcast, she told me I was... a. I don't remember what her exact words were, but I remember what I heard, which was that you're a terrible listener. <laughs> and, you know, it... Early on, I think that it was more that I was so caught up in what, whatever the next question I wanted to ask my guests that I was missing really valuable stuff that they were sharing, which could have, which should have led me down a path of like an even better question, right? If you're like really paying attention to what people, and this is just, this is like generally podcast or not, right? Good active listening skills are something that can be extremely powerful just for people in general, for building relationships, and especially for sellers. And so, you know, early on in podcasting, you know, you kind of try to plan out the episode and you're kind of thinking what you want to ask. And if you get really caught up in that, then you miss really big things that are like right in front of you, right? And that could happen in a sales call, right? If you're on a discovery call and it's like, yeah, I got to ask these questions and you're missing these really good breadcrumbs that your prospects are leaving right in front of you. It is such a powerful way to learn and kind of figure that out because you get that experience. and. It's super cool for it's cool. I like it when I ask a question that can goes deeper into a thought that someone wasn't really anticipating because they've gone through the podcast routine of going from person to person to person, or even I've even had some folks recently, especially when they go on book tours where they give a list of questions that you can ask. Yeah. My first view on that is. Well, if I'm getting this list, there's a lot of other people who are getting this list. And what are we going to do? Are we just going to pull a string back and hear the same clip of information? And then yeah. where does anybody get any value out of that? They could listen to somebody else's podcast and get that. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah. I mean, I've definitely had some of those folks on the show where it's, you know, feels like almost scripted a bit, like they just have a set talk track. And then there's also like typically, you know, if you start to go on podcasts a lot, there's just certain things people also want you to talk about. That you're maybe kind of known for. And I kind of appreciate, you know, some of the things that you and I chatted about before, which is something similar that I ask folks is like, hey, what do you not get to talk about as much as that you'd like to? And, and sometimes that can bring up some interesting topics. But if you think about this even on the other side, right, of the person, like, okay, let's say if, you know, if it's podcasts, host and guest 
or a seller and a prospect. When you're not listening intently to that person, a lot of times it becomes very obvious because they may say something that they feel is really important to them or really valuable in the relationship. And you just gloss over it and go into your next question. And it's the easiest way to not build rapport or trust with that person. How'd you take that feedback from your wife when she gave it to you? Oh, it hurt because I thought I was a great listener. <laughs> right. And, you know, as one of my first guests early on in the show, and he just said something about his, you know, childhood that was, you know, pretty tragic. Like, and I just asked my next question as if like I didn't even hear it. And so, yeah. And then, but, you know, it was a good learning lesson because then it made me like really self aware of that. And so anytime I catch myself, because, you know, that's just, it's the human brain, right? It, it's just the mind is a, a powerful thing. And sometimes it operates not the way you always want it to. And so, you know, it's kind of like if you're meditating and, you know, you bring yourself back to your breath when you start thinking, you know, it's when you're engaged in a conversation, whether it's on a podcast or in a sales call, as soon as your mind starts going to that place of like, oh, I got to ask this thing, or I need to find out this thing. It's usually because something to do with like your own self-serving agenda, you got to kind of pause and like, just listen to what, you know, the person is saying, because that could take you down a totally different path. And that could be, that could determine whether that call goes well or not well. You had mentioned meditation as you were going through this. Do you have a meditative practice? I do. I do. I've been meditating for probably almost 15 years. I don't do it perfectly. And there's definitely a sense of times where I'm like, yeah, I really need to get back to doing that. But I think early on, I used to try to sit for like a long 20, 30 minutes and thought like, oh, this was awesome. And then I found that actually just doing like short two minute, five minute, 10 minute, like maybe multiple times throughout the day, when I'm doing it the way that I like to and feel that I should be, that's been the most effective for me. Yeah. How'd you go through the process of kind of finding your way there and figuring out what's most effective? It's kind of like, if you think of the analogy of like the person that's like, oh, I need to get in shape. I need to get in shape. Right. And they want to like do it all like super fast. Right. And like, or like get it done or have like maybe a little bit too much structure around, you know, trying to get healthy and eat clean and maybe exercise, it makes it hard for it to be sustainable. And so that's the same sort of way that it was not working for me with meditation where, you know, if I was running late or had a lot going on, I have four kids, you know, so like finding 20 minutes is near impossible sometimes. (laughs) If I can find two minutes, I can find five minutes. If I'm lucky, I can find 10 minutes. And so what happens is like, it just doesn't get done and then it doesn't get done and it doesn't get done and it doesn't get done. So you have to find a way to make it work that, you know, suits your lifestyle. That's also sustainable. How old are your kids? So I have eight, seven, four, and 16 months. So you have four kids under 10. Yeah. (laughs) Do you have kids? I do. We do. 17 and a 20 year old. They'll be 18 and 21 here in September. So a little bit further along on the chain. And it is the things that you find that you can create time for as they get older are really powerful because then they're at, they're out. Like they can drive away, they can get a car and go someplace where right yeah. now they're dependent on you moving them. Like depending yeah. on whether or not your 16 month old is walking and I forget yeah, probably walking by now. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. So that one can move around just a couple of months back. You were actually having to go move the move this thing around. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's just an interesting thing. Cause everybody's so anxious to get their kid walking. And then once the kid starts walking, you're like, Oh, this is actually a lot more work now because they get into everything, <laughs> everything they could do. They, and they disappear. Like you realize, Oh no, I've got to get, like, so we've got a, uh, we have a couple of dogs in the house. One is a puppy. He is seven months old, or we've had him in the house for about seven months. Now we have like baby gates around the house to kind of qu- cord off different pieces of it. So yeah. don't throw away the baby gates. If you plan on having puppies at some point in time, that would be one piece of advice. Yeah. 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 Save the baby gates, right? Save. So, but I guess with kids, teenage age, you have different problems, I'd imagine. <laughs> uh, they, 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 that's the thing is it doesn't get any easier. It just gets different. And there are problems that you face <laughs> now that you wouldn't have been able to face when they're younger. And it's kind of like this whole thing that, and we'll get, we'll get in more into like the sales stuff that we talk about it. This is the, it's kind of like anything else that you do the early on in your career, 
you think certain things are so hard and then you realize they become kind of second nature that you start to level up in areas of the game. And now you can do some really hard and really interesting and really creative things. The meditation piece, I think is super interesting. I had tried meditation and failed multiple times in trying to figure it out. And it started to feel like, like, is this not for me? And you get that less than kind of feeling that happens mm-hmm. when you're trying to figure out fit. And what I found was I actually could look at golf as a meditative practice. Mm. And I completely clear my mind for that period of time between when my pre-shot routine starts and when I hit the ball. And you know, like, and really it's more clear my mind from the point, the last point of address and when I start the swing and through the swing and try to do that. Right now, it, and sadly, it's like 90 something times per round. And at some point in time, I hope it gets down to somewhere in the 70s times per round. But there's this practice that we go through that applies in all of the things we do, whether it's raising kids or it's interviewing guests and having conversations there or it's getting out on the golf course. All of these things start to apply and we can learn those lessons. We can get better at listening, get better at focus and get better at dealing with problem solving and decision making. What do you think? I think that you're absolutely right. And and if you think about, you know, meditation a little bit, you know, broader, it's yeah. it's a practice of mindfulness, right? And so that could be, I mean, you can do you can mindfully do anything. You can mindfully play golf. You can mindfully record a podcast episode. You can mindfully run a discovery call. You can even mindfully eat your lunch. You know, so it's just like being really present in the moment with whatever that one thing is that you're doing, whether it's breathing, playing golf, you know, doesn't matter. And so <clears throat> for some people actually sitting and meditating, maybe it's not for them, but sounds like you found what works for you. I think the important thing here is like as as sellers or founders that sell or leaders, we're expected to perform at really high levels. And a lot of times people think that it has more to do with those like hard selling skills. And it has more to do with the, like the inside work of like taking better care of ourselves personally, finding these type of things so that we can perform better and at a higher level in our professional roles. Anytime you get on an airplane, you get reminded of this, right? I mean, one of the things that they'll tell you is if you're traveling with kids, put your oxygen mask on first. You have to yeah. take care of self before you're going to be in a position to start taking care of others or be there to take care of others, whether it's people inside your family or it's your customers, you have to take care of self. So let's talk a bit about that whole... Actually, before we talk about taking care of self, share some information about the podcast. Let's give some background. Where can people find it? How long have you been doing it? Give us some details. Yeah. So been doing sales transformation for, I think, almost three years now. And it's a daily podcast, short episodes. We're now getting ready to launch our third season, really leveling up a lot of things, the branding, the content, the guests, and things like that. So we took like a short pause. Not sure when this will necessarily come out, but I am imagine by the time it comes out, we'll be back launching season three. And they're daily episodes with some of the best minds in sales to help transform the way that sellers and sales leaders perform. So how do you keep up with a daily episode yeah. cadence? So a couple of things. Usually, so we used to do much shorter, like 10 minute episodes. Okay. Now we're increasing those to about 20 minutes, but one recording becomes two episodes. Now that it's not like a necessarily a part one, part two, but one recording becomes two episodes. Those could be dropped at different times, just depending on the sequence of so we have sort of a Monday, here's what's coming this week. And then we have, you know, Monday through Friday dropping those episodes. And then we have a f- sort of a Saturday like TLDR sort of recap of all the best moments of everything. So do you record in batches? Like do you record so uh, like with with this, we yeah. record I record well in advance. So this episode we're recording. And I, I say that I don't want to timestamp stuff. And then I go, inevitably, I figure out a way to timestamp stuff. We're yeah. recording here on July 11th. This episode likely will go live in the middle to late part of August, somewhere in that kind of yeah. time period. And ideally, I've got six to 12 episodes in the can at any point in time so that we don't miss a week because yeah. we've missed weeks in the past and have actually gone through periods where we did once a month. So do you record, do you record in batches? Do you, kind of, how do you think about that stuff? Yeah. So because it is a lot of work to do that much content and that's not even considering how often I guest on shows as well. And so what I found to work for me is we do them all twice a month on a Thursday we do, you know, four hours of recording. 
every other Thursday, basically. And that gets us enough content for the entire month. Very cool. Yeah. I think that's one of the challenges some people think about when they hesitate or pause on the idea of getting started on recording is feeling like you've got to do it each day. Like you've just got to go out there and record and then push it live or record and push it live. And it just that if you if you can plan ahead and get some content together, you can actually you can still go through the process of recording each day, but it doesn't mean that that content ends up going live each day. So you can, you can find my point here. I think one of the things that's coming up is you find your process that works for you, similar to the discussion around meditation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've done it the other way where it's just like, Hey, I just fit them in wherever in between everything else that I have going on. And I found that I was end up rescheduling a lot of times because it was just like, it just became a little bit too overwhelming of like shifting mindshare on in different directions. What else have you learned from the podcast that you didn't expect? It's cool to hear the one on the listening. Anything else yeah. jump to mind? I mean, I've learned a lot. I've had so many great guests on that I've just learned things from them, but I'm trying to think more like on a general level. You know, I think that I don't think I realized how much of a better you know, seller it would make me. Right. So I think, you know, I'm kind of one of those weird people that thinks, Hey, if you're in sales, like you should have a podcast. And there's a lot of people that disagree with that and think like, Hey, everybody shouldn't have a podcast. And you know, what's the point? And it's like, yeah, you should. I don't care if you're like brand new SDR and documenting your journey of breaking into sales and doing whatever. Right. And even if nobody listens to your show, even if like nobody listens to your show, there's still a tremendous amount of value in it because it helps you build a network. I mean, it's a great way to network and build relationships with people. It will allow you to open doors that you wouldn't be able to open otherwise. You know, getting access to people that would be harder to get access to otherwise. And ultimately, you learn so much. So, you know, you could have a podcast about something that you're extremely curious about or where you interview the types of people that you sell to so that you're like learning different things. I mean, there's so many different angles I could take this. But ultimately, I believe that if you're in sales, having a podcast is a great idea. You don't have to overthink it. It doesn't have to be like the highest production value. And it literally doesn't matter if anybody listens because you will become a better seller just through consistently being a podcaster. 100%. And and I think it goes back to that point that your wife mentioned. You'll learn to be a better listener because after you review the tape, after you listen back to your episodes, you realize how many missed opportunities you had to go a little bit deeper, creates an opportunity to reflect. And something it's done for me is it's helped me be more concise in the way that I ask questions. Like when I'm in a weird place, I feel like I build up the background on the question. So I'm kind of leading the witness and getting all of this other background information rather than just simply asking the basic question, like, what are you struggling with? Or how are you working through that? Why does that continue to happen? Like all of these basic things. So it will make you, it will create an opportunity for you to become a better listener, a better asker of questions and create space for reflection. So I'm with Colin, go out and start recording and listen to it. The one mistake I wish I would have done different, one thing I wish I would have done differently when we first started is I think we lean too much on editing, like figuring out how close I need to stand to the microphone and to cut down on the breath noises and some of the ums and all of that other kind of stuff. I think we, Mm -hmm. I think we made things a little bit more produced than it needed to be. And it slowed down the learning practice for me where the learning started to get a little bit better is when I started shooting more video content and then had to go through the process of actually working through that piece. Yeah. Let's talk. I love that. And and it's funny because I was just going to ask you, I was like, man, I'm just really curious now what you've learned, but you already shared a little bit with us now. And I think that that's a, that's a really valuable point, right? Because you're not going to get the, you know, the best episode by, you know, spending endless of hours editing it, right? You're going to get the best episode through repetition of just doing more and getting better and learning how to, you know, navigate conversations and ask good questions and simple things like how far to stand from the mic and, and things like that. But it's the same with sales calls, right? You're not going to get better by practicing role playing, you know, a hundred times. You're going to get better by just getting more at bats and making mistakes and learning from them and improving from them. It's so all yes. And I'm going to give one piece just because you mentioned that microphone thing. And some people will talk about like the hang loose sign to to figure yeah. out space between mouth and microphone. And I kind of go back and back and forth as far as how close I'll get to it. But one of the things that someone told me early on is you can actually move the microphone closer to you. And that was like 
uh, groundbreaking for me. It was almost like somebody discovered. I always thought that the <laughs> microphone was stuck wherever it was. And we had a different, I had a different stand and now I've got a, some kind of a boom that allow me to move it around, but you can move the microphone closer to you. So just like when you're taking pictures, you can use a zoom to zoom in on something, or you can move closer to the subject. There are multiple variables that you can play with. So yeah, I mean, and, and, to and to kind of tie that into, you know, sales calls where most people are on zoom now, right? Having a good setup and, you know, sounding good and confident and, you know, your tone and all of those things are important in your sales calls. Even just making good, you know, eye contact, which is weird for a lot of people because you're not staring at the person, you're actually staring at the camera so that they feel you're staring at them. You know, all of those little details now where mostly people are selling virtual for the most part, just for the, I mean, a lot of people are obviously doing in person and stuff again, but virtual is just so convenient. A lot of people, you know, have sort of adapted to this, you know, working from home and have no more commute or can eat lunch with their family or their wife or whatever. And so there's a lot of those small little details too, you know, in this selling world, the virtual selling world that I think a lot of people are still, still haven't picked up because I see it all the time. What And it doesn't take a lot either. So let's talk a little bit about tech. Like what kind of tech are you using now? Grant, you've got the professional podcast, so your tech's might be a bit different than, well, actually, I'll, I'll ask the direct question. What kind of tech are you using now from an audio and a video perspective? So I use the Rode Podcaster for podcasting and then I have like some Sony headphones. I don't use that on sales calls. I just use AirPods because it's just convenient and they sound good enough. And I don't like wearing all this gear, <laughs> headgear for, for sales calls, but I just use a you know $150 Logitech you know 1080 any 1080 USB camera is going to be good. Or, you know, a lot of the Macs have good enough cameras built in. They're pretty decent. I would say the thing that most people don't consider is their lighting and their background, which I think that the, that's the number one thing that I think a lot of people don't pay enough attention to because you'd be surprised like branding matters and, you know, how you show up, you know, in your sales calls is a representation of you and your company and your brand. And so, you know, having a good, you know, decent setup, maybe, you know, some visual things that maybe represent you a little bit, all of those things are, are important, you know, things that are important that never used to be. So how do you think about that background and that setup and the message that you want to convey to others? What are some of the things that come to mind for you? So for me, I mean, uh, I know this, people can't necessarily see this, right? But I've got like, you know, some of my favorite books, I've got like a Buddha on a shelf, you know, I've got a picture of me coaching my son's baseball team and another picture of, of one of my daughters. Uh, and I've got like a nice, you know, dark background that like kind of represents me, I guess, the, the color and is also in alignment with even just like our company colors a little bit. So that's how I thought through like setting up my background, but I can't stand virtual backgrounds. They just annoy me. Some people yeah. are fans of them. To me, if it's like a blurry background or a virtual background. And I guess you know, sometimes maybe you're traveling or whatever, you might have a situation where like virtual background is the best solution. But generally I always feel like, what are, what are they trying to hide? <laughs> you know, when there's a virtual background. So personally, and I don't, it might just be a hang up that I have. I don't know how you feel about them, Mike, but it almost like creates a little distrust. Like, what are you hiding back there? <laughs> I, I was on a call with uh, a company I'm doing some work with just yesterday. And Two people were in the same room, literally the same office. One of them had a virtual background where it looked like they were at the shore in you know, New Jersey, and yeah. you could look, you could see the water in the background. The other one had this picture on the wall of Payne Stewart, uh, where it was a plaque of Payne Stewart after he won his last U.S. Open. So, one of them is authentic. I know that they're in the same room with each other, and yeah. I agree with you. I think the I am I'm not a fan of the of the virtual background. I get that some people don't have a setup where they can create certain space. You know, but we we don't show video on the podcast, but you know, Colin's background, he's got this dark gray background and it looks like he's in a corner of a office just because there it looks like I I can't tell if that's a corner of the wall or if it's just separate painting. Is that the corner of the office wall or is yeah, that separate it's painting? A, yeah. It's a separate wall, yeah. So you just have a wall there. So that and what's cool about his setup is he doesn't have a lot of shadows. Like I had my background. I used to work, I used to have my office in the same room that I would work out in. When the lights were on, you'd see shadow of a gymnastic rings hanging there. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's it just, it was weird because it looked like you know, it looked like you could have a hangman's noose just hanging there in the middle of the background. You're kind of like, what am I doing here? Now 
the biggest challenge I run into right now, and it's part of my brand, but I have a glass whiteboard behind me. After writing on glass at an office, I was like, but there, I can't go back to a normal whiteboard. It creates crazy reflections. I have to set up ring lights to point up against the ceiling and reflect down to cut out on the reflection. Now, Colin yeah. sees the reflections, including a ceiling fan light because of the way that a cam- my camera is set up right now. But usually when you're watching other videos, you won't see that stuff, which is really hard to remove. But I, I need the whiteboard there because it's part of the brand. To Colin's point, you can communicate something really effective to people with these visual icons that you have out there, whether it's the Buddha or some of the books or home plate with a picture. They were create an opportunity for you to share what's important to you, share, convey a thought. If you're not operating with a level of intention in this environment where you're creating that way to convey that message, then you're missing an opportunity. And it can be super, super simple. You can find a small place someplace, whether it's in a closet or wherever. And sometimes closets can be really good from an audio perspective, but you can find a small place where you can do this stuff. So I think that key on background is really important. And I agree with you, the virtual background, I'm okay with people blurring. Like sometimes when I travel, you want to blur just because nobody wants to see the bed with covers all over the place and pillows and whatnot at a yeah. courtyard Marriott. But, that, but that's a, that's the time where I'll put some of the kind of the artificial stuff in the, in the background. Yeah. But even in that situation, like you can even, you know, sometimes move the desk and like have the window if you have a good view or something like, it's funny because you would think it shouldn't matter that much. But it actually does. And I think it's part brand and it's part building rapport and trust, you know, virtually. And people make judgments based on visuals, you know. And if you look like you're a dude working in a garage, a dusty old garage, which maybe some of us are, you know, that's what you're representing, right? And so I think making sure you have a, a good, you know, space that makes you look like the professional that you are is important. And you can get a relatively inexpensive microphone. Like the microphone I use is an ATR 2100. It's 79 bucks on Amazon. You can get a a microphone that will sound good and cut out some of the other background noise. And the thing that I like about this microphone is I don't have to wear headphones. Now, some people will say, hey, when we're recording, make sure you've got headphones on because it cuts down on echo. I don't know if you're hearing any kind of echo on your end, Colin, Mm -mm. but it cuts, it is really good at cutting down any of the background noise. So you can do this in a relatively inexpensive way and start to differentiate yourself from others who are also interacting with those customers, selling with to those customers, creating an experience, those customers. You don't have to break the bank. Now you can really level up tech and start to break the bank, but you don't need to when you get started. And again, that ATR 2100 is 79 bucks and it's a good USB plug-in microphone. Yeah. I think that it's just something to think about, right? Is how do you want to present yourself and how people see you on camera, how people hear you, that is a representation of you. So if there's opportunity to level that up, you definitely should. And what better way to transform, we're going to go ahead and do a, what do they call this in the, in the industry? A, um, it's not a throwback. It's a transition or whatever, whatever it's called. Anyway, I completely broke the train of thought here, but what about, you know, what better way to transform the interactions that you have with customers than to operate with a level of intention and demonstrate the quality and care that you put in to things? And so let's talk about sales transformation. What are some of the things that you're seeing when people start talking about sales transformation that either surprise you that they're not already doing or surprise you because they're just flat wrong or surprise you because they are overly complicated. Now you get to choose your own adventure, three doors, either surprise you that they're flat wrong. And I forget what the third one was, but choose your door. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's the common transformations that people talk about where they go from like this role to that role or this to enterprise seller or, you know, selling something that nobody knows anything about to breaking into tech, like a lot of that. But I think the one that is not talked about it as much or can surprise people. And it's even part of my own kind of journey is from being like a very transactional commission breath salesperson to somebody who actually 
cares enough about their prospects and actually transitions to you know helping and serving their clients. And so that was something like I learned a lot of bad habits early on in sales. Like I was the typical salesperson that everybody hates. And so I had to unlearn a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of people that share that similar experience, but people don't talk about it enough, right? Because we all know that like sales in general, you know, there's a lot of people that don't trust salespeople. There's a lot of people that still have these like pushy, sleazy tactics and everybody pictures the used car salesman, right? But there's a lot of that's in that's in B2B sales and in tech. And a lot of people that are led by these type of you know leaders that are teaching these things either end up that way or have at some point have to realize like, hey, this doesn't feel so good. And then they have to unlearn it and learn how to actually do things right. Why do people continue to fall into this trap of doing the stereotypical things that tend to irritate people when it comes to working with sales folks? Because sales is a performance role, right? And sellers are compensated based on how they perform commission. And some people are willing to make sacrifices, you know, sacrifice their integrity for the sake of hitting their number or making club or getting their commission or getting promoted. And so that looks like lying or being dishonest or misleading or overselling solution, you know, all these different things, being pushy, using these sort of tactics. And ultimately, it comes from the top down, right? If the top is okay with that and is like, hey, we just need to hit our numbers. And a lot of this can come from different pressures of trying to get to the next funding round or sell anything at any cost, right? Or, hey, we got to appease investors, like you name it. There's a hundred different reasons why people would say are the reason why these things happen. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people that are teaching the right way to do things. And there's sales organizations that also are that way. But there's sometimes I think it's easy for maybe people like me and you to think that the problem's not that big because we surround ourselves with like-minded people. But the reality is, is I think we've still only made you know a small little chip. And so if we just look at B2B sales as a whole, where there's a lot of this stuff that's still rampant today, and even like the bro culture and like, you name it, it just goes on. So let's say I'm out there and I'm looking for a new role as a sales professional, or I'm just, I'm struggling with the role that I have inside the organization I'm working at. How can I test a company to determine, are they more progressive in the way that they think about and engage from a sales perspective so that I'm moving into the right place versus being sold a bill of goods and then finding myself in the, in the boiler room or in the bullpen or in that kind of an environment? What are some indicators I can look at? publicly on an organization to determine determine fit. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple things, right? I mean, obviously you could do the typical like glass door or look at reviews. I think the most powerful thing is to reach out to other people that work there and ask them, you know, how they feel about working there. Typically, a lot of times sellers get it starts with sellers getting sold a bill of goods in the interview of how awesome the company is and how everybody's crushing quota and how, you know, this, this and this is happening and we're taking this thing to the moon, right? So a lot of times I say like, hey, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably the case. And you got to fact check stuff because it's happened to me before where it's like, yeah, things are great. This is happening. This is happening. Here's where we're at currently. And then you find out, oh, no, no, that's not where we're at, right? Hey, we have these logos. And you find out like, "Eh, we don't really have those logos. It's like one person that's using it. So fact check stuff. And the easiest way to do that is to check with other people and if there's anything you're uncertain or unsure about, like you should ask for proof or verification. And if they have a problem with that and they're not okay with transparency, it's probably not a good fit anyway. So those are a couple things. And then there's a company, I can't even remember the name of the company right now that's you know helping put transparency around a lot of this stuff where it's like everybody gets promised, you know, OTE and it's like, yeah, but nobody's hitting quota. So like yeah, you your might be OTE about, means nothing. You might be thinking about rep view. Is it yeah. Rep you? Yeah. yeah. Rep, rep, you. rep you. The work that they're doing is absolutely phenomenal and providing folks with more transparency and access to information yeah. so that you can avoid some of those pitfalls. And not a lot of people know about rep view. And so I think you know, sharing that name is a good one because there's, there are these resources that are out there and there are, there are both good actors and bad actors 
And you might not be able to distinguish between the two because you get those happy ears and that excitement, that optimism. Like you've got to be an optimistic person if you're going to be in a revenue producing role. Yeah. So if you're looking for the good stuff, ask those questions like the ones that Colin mentioned to help validate fit, validate understanding and feasibility test things as you're going through. But yeah, RevView is one of those tools that's really powerful. I like that you mentioned Glassdoor. How about things like G2? You ever use any of those? You see, it's like yeah, I mean, you can there? see you can see what their customers are saying about them. I think that's also a, g- a good resource as well. The thing is, is we live in such a digital world, right? There's some of these resources that are they're super helpful, but I think sometimes people can see what's going on on social, and it can be a little bit misleading, right? And that can go both ways. That can be hey, this company looks like it's awesome and doing great work and blah, blah, blah. And come to find out like that's not necessarily the case. That's the, the, the facade on social, like that happens. And then there's even the flip side where I've seen people get jobs based on how they're perceived online and realize they are very much unqualified for specific roles. And companies you know, have been foolish and made hires based on people's social clout thinking like, oh, it's a, you know, a marketing channel and like, we'll be able to like leverage their network and they'll be able to promote us and we'll just give them this role and come to find out like they're really terrible at their job because they're spending so much time online. That's awesome. Another example of that one is the person who is, I'm going to shots fired to some extent, but the person who's in enterprise sales or a VP of sales at a Fortune 50 organization and then wants to go play startup. Hmm. Building from zero to one is completely different yeah. than doing that inside someone who everybody knows what their ticker symbol is. Yeah. And, you know, and claiming, oh, knock down this logo and that logo. And it's like, okay, were those inherited accounts? Like, it's a totally different ball game. So I think that, I think you've got to, these days we, we live in such a digital world, there's resources that can help you fact check stuff. But there's also things going on that can be also misleading, and that's on both sides. Is Outbound dead? No, absolutely not. But it's broken. What's broken about it? Everything. Why? Because everybody is playing it like it's a numbers game more. And that's all the way from, let's hire more people. Let's make more calls. Let's send more emails. And most Outbound teams report to sales, and I'm a salesperson like through and through, but it should report to marketing. And I know that's a huge debate that's been going on for a long time, but I'll explain it. Marketing runs things like they run acquisition channels, right? Paid, SEO, whatever, right? When outbound is treated as an acquisition channel, meaning there's a strategy, its decisions are made based on data, it's constantly measured for performance and optimized on a regular basis, it works. And when outbound is treated that way, it works. Most outbound sales teams that do outbound are not ran that way. They rarely review sequences for performance and optimization. Their solution is typically, let's just hire more SDRs and do more volume or calls more emails and we'll eventually get to our number. And that model's broken. And that's why you know so many companies had to lay off so many SDRs and BDRs when times got a little tough. You've got a book coming up. Are you sure what that book is? Yeah. So myself and the co-founders of Leadium, Kevin and Sergey, put a book together called Outbound Sales Simplified. And that'll be coming out soon. It's going to break down the six key ingredients to a successful outbound sales strategy. Awesome. When the book is out, we'll update links in the show notes so you've got it. Where can people go to find out more about what you're working on today? Yeah, the best place, number one is look, it's really hard to consistently you know, put on a good podcast like this here. So the first thing you could do is make sure you subscribe to this show, write an honest review, share this show with your friends. It really helps you know, Mike to, to reach more people. And it's the best way you can show your gratitude for him putting together an awesome show and, and bringing folks on. If you absolutely are a podcast junkie and love podcasts kind of like myself, then you can check out Sales Transformation on whatever podcast app you're listening to this on. And that's the best place to learn about everything new and exciting that's going on with me and or Lidium as well. Awesome. 
If you know somebody who would enjoy this conversation, please share it with them. Let Colin and I know via LinkedIn. We like to see those shares. The ratings and reviews really help. So Colin, thanks for mentioning that. Sales is a thinking process. Business is a thinking process. Life is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about your process? Thank you.